Hello. 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 That's my wife <laughs> over there. She says she can't come on camera because her head is wet. My hair is wet. Because she just got home from work and she had to wash the COVID out of her hair. <laughs> so, I guess she's not going to be joining us on camera. No. no. You don't want to come get on camera? No. Can you guys hear her? I don't know. Can you hear me? Nobody's. Well, somebody's there, but they're not answering. Okay. Okay. All right, I'm going to sign on now. Okay, bye. Bye. Not you. I was saying bye to her. Um, all right, well, hello, Darlene. Glad you could join us. Hello, John. Glad you could be with us, brother. Good to see you. Hello, Jane. All right, everybody's trickling in. That's good to see. All right, everybody can hear me. That's wonderful. I appreciate that. You know, these technical bugs, just when you think you got it working, something doesn't work, and that's kind of how it goes. Hi, Venus. Glad you could join us. I don't know if you can hear my children yelling on the other side of the door right now, but... <laughs> Ooh, yes, we can. <laughs> okay, I, I deserve that, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, my wife works at a hospital, so we have a cleanliness protocol where she gets a shower as soon as she gets home from work and changes her clothes and all that, just to try to be safe. Thankfully, um, the hospital she works at is doing much better, and she actually does not have any COVID patients on her floor right now. So that is a huge praise. Good evening. <laughs> um, all right, well, it's glad to have everybody with us. Um, we are gonna start off our service tonight with some prayer time. Hello, Diane, glad you could join us. Uh, we're gonna be starting off tonight with some prayer time. I have some uh, a short scripture reading and a devotional reading. Okay, um, Jane has just given us a prayer request, uh, an unspoken, for her daughter Gina. I have another unspoken for a family that uh, had a loved one who passed away. Uh, I don't have permission to share details, but just ask for prayer. Um, I do have uh, some... A prayer challenge from our general superintendents to share that involves the international church but we will be having prayer for any requests in just a few minutes so if anyone would like to share a prayer request you are very much welcome to do so go ahead and post it in the comments and I'll acknowledge them as they come up if you don't hear me acknowledge it um, please go ahead and post it a second time every once in a while a comment doesn't make it through we don't really know why but it happens sometimes um, also, um, as you may have just noticed that Jane asked for an unspoken prayer request, if you have something that you'd like us to pray for, but maybe you're not comfortable putting it out on the internet or sharing it publicly, it is certainly okay to just say that it's an unspoken prayer request and then we can pray for you and God knows what you need and we can lift that up. Hello Sloans, glad you could be with us, glad you could be with us. Um, yeah. All right. Well, I'd like to start off this evening by reading from our prayer mobilization line newsletter. That's a, a weekly prayer email that comes out through uh, Nazarene Missions International. And uh, if you want to sign up for that, you can go to nmi.org. I always forget what button you're supposed to click, but if you go to nmi.org, you'll find the sign up for the newsletter. Um, each week, there is a short scripture reading with a devotional passage and then some prayer requests. One of the things that I really appreciate about this email is, especially in this season, there seems to be so much going on in our own personal lives, in our own neighborhood, in our own cities, that sometimes it's good to feel like we're getting our head up and looking around and seeing what's going on in the rest of the world. And I, I think it's healthy for us to take some time to pray for other parts of the body of Christ. You know, our, our uh, our believers and our brothers and sisters and just our neighbors on this planet in uh, other corners of the globe. So it's good to take a moment and pray for those other areas as well. Um, tonight's scripture reading for the devotional is from James chapter 1 verses 2 through 5 and uh, this is one of I don't know if favorites is the right word. I do really like this passage. I have found this passage a little challenging in my life. And I've been trying to learn how to follow it. So 
I'd like to share James chapter 1, verses 2 through 5, and then we'll have a little bit of a devotional passage about it. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So there's a lot of meat on the bone here for this one. Um, the general superintendent who wrote this week's devotion focused on the big picture of this statement. It's, this is what the, the message says. James calls us to prayer, and if you read the whole letter, if you read the whole book of James, you will see that James' words are, and I bolded this part, his words are a call to prayer that changes us. So not, not a call to prayer for necessarily other people or a call to prayer to receive something or to do something, but a call to prayer that will change us. Um, and I like this next phrase. It aligns our heart and mind with God's heart and mind. I think that's a really wonderful description of the purpose of prayer. You know, the purpose of prayer is not for me to tell things to God because God already knows. You know, I'm not, I'm not telling God anything. He doesn't already know when I pray. When I tell God that I need help with something, when I pray for someone who's sick, God already knows those things. The purpose here is for you and I to be changed and for our hearts and minds to become closer to being aligned with God's. Um, they jump ahead to um, verse 17. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Throughout the letter of James, the call to prayer is conjoined with a call to action. You, James um, the book of James contains the passage, Faith without works is dead. It's one that's often quoted. Throughout the letter of James, the call to prayer is conjoined with a call to action that impacts others in a beautiful way. Actually, James states strongly that action will follow being aligned in prayer to the heart and mind of God. So basically, when we pray, it helps us to become closer to God. It helps my heart match God's heart. And when that happens, it naturally produces action in my life. It naturally produces a drive to love and to care and to serve, to, to be Christ-like. So that the closer my heart gets to God's heart, I guess you could say the more I become like Jesus, right? The more my heart starts to look like Jesus' heart. There are some specific prayer requests they do lift up as well. And this is what I was mentioning. If we only ever think about our little corner of the world, um, we're missing a part of what it means to be in the body of Christ. So there are some prayer requests here for the world. First of all, um, they've asked us to pray for missionaries around the world as they seek new ways to inform churches about what, is God, what God is doing. And they make a note that um, four in 10 people in the world have not yet heard the gospel. And I'll be honest, that was much higher than I expected. Um, so prayer for our missionaries as they seek to share the good news of Jesus. And as, as difficult as COVID-19 has made life in the US, it has made things much harder in other countries as well. So, something to remember. The next prayer is that God would continue to give us in the church the grace and the strength to minister both locally and globally. That we might minister to our neighbor right next door, but also not forget the needs of our distant neighbors. The next prayer request is that um, that God would continue to give grace to every believer to proclaim the kingdom of God in our neighborhoods and in the farthest areas of the world. 
pray that the limited resources of our church would be multiplied to meet the needs that are so great in many needy communities around the world. Pray that our hearts and minds would be one with God's as we pray and live in these unprecedented days. And also, finally, to pray that our dare, our, excuse me, pray that our daily actions will reflect the directions and heart of our Lord. Pray that our lives would reflect God. And I think those are those are some very important requests. They help us remember what's close and what's far, what's urgent and what's important. You know, that's one of those tricky things. Sometimes our urgent needs overshadow the most important needs. You know, the fact that you're hungry sometimes overshadows the fact that you're not growing in Jesus. <laughs> and uh, we've got to keep that in perspective, that balance between the urgent and the important. So again, I'll just share a couple prayer requests that were put up. Um, we want to continue to pray for the unspoken prayer request for Gina. We have another unspoken prayer request for a family connected to our church who lost a loved one this week. Um, not sure. Um, I know I can't share all the details, but um, we do want to continue to pray for um, Lindsay. She is still having some back trouble, so she was able to see the doctor and got some relief, but it's kind of flaring back up again, as I think a lot of us know back problems tend to do. So please keep Lindsay in your prayers. Um, it's really hard to have an 11 month old and back problems at the same time. So uh, please lift her up in your prayers. Um, we also have um, a prayer request from someone at men's group who received new neighbors. New neighbors moved in next door. So we want to lift that person up as they try to minister to their neighbors. And um, yeah. So do we have, if we have any other prayer requests, please go ahead and share them in the comments. Those are the ones that I have right now to share. Um, one to lift up for our district is just back to school times. A lot of families are having to make this decision of whether or not to try to do the remote instruction or in-person instruction. A lot of our schools are trying to figure out how they're going to make that work, trying to line up you know, the PPE and the hand sanitizer and figure out how to do all this. So just a special prayer request for our students, our teachers, our school administrators, and uh, our parents <laughs> as we all try to get this school thing worked out. We've only got about a month and uh, it's crunch time. So please remember that in your prayers. All right, well, I'm not seeing any other prayer requests come through the comments, so let's go ahead and pray together. Please join me. Father God, I thank you for this chance to come together tonight. I thank you for this, this devotional thought, this reflection from James. And Father, I pray that those words would be true in our heart, that as we pray, our hearts and our minds would become closer aligned to you. Um, Father, we know that even though our hearts change in an instant, that we are all called to a growth in spiritual maturity that takes a lifetime. And so for each and every one of us, whether we are a, a baby Christian or an old grizzled vet of the church, um, please help us to follow you, help us to surrender to you, and help us to give ourselves over to your formation of our lives. Father, we lift up Gina with her unspoken prayer request. Father, you know what's going on in her life and what she needs. And well, I, I ask that you'd care for her, not just that you would take care of her, but like not, not just meet the need, but to help her feel your presence. Help her to feel your spirit with her. Help her to feel your peace in her life. Help her to know way deep down that she is loved and uh, that she is your child. Father, we lift up this family who lost a loved one this week. We pray that you would give them comfort in their grief. And uh, we also lift up the, the family in our church who has a new neighbor, has new neighbors. And we pray that they would be 
um, salt and light <laughs> to their neighbors. Help them to feel settled and welcomed. And uh, if they don't know Jesus, uh, we hope that their neighbors can share it with them. Father, I also pray that you'd be with us in our Bible study tonight as we talk about Stephen and the final moments of his life. Father, please help our hearts to be receptive to your message and help this word to sink down deep and change us. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, Darlene said definitely schools, which I think I just forgot to pray for. So we'll add that in. We'll pray again at the, the end. I didn't write it down because it was my prayer request, and so I forgot to mention it when I prayed. Um, but we'll we'll do another prayer session at the end and cover that. Uh, so we are in our um, Wednesday evening Bible study. We are going through the book of Acts. So I'm gonna change my setup a little here. We are going through the book of Acts. Last week we finished up chapter six. And this week we're going to be sharing chapter 7. There, there is a little bit of uh, difficult content here at the end. Uh, yes, Pastor Matt, you did just hear Pepper barking. Um, anytime anyone walks by my house, Pepper, make sure to let us know. Uh, so we finished chapter 6 last week. And tonight we are getting into chapter 7. Uh, I think we're going to do all of chapter 7 tonight. The bulk of chapter 7 is uh, Stephen's speech to the high priest. So where we left things last week, Stephen had been arrested and been accused with um, a you know, false charges, um, but they had paid witnesses to lie and say that Stephen had blasphemed God, which according to Old Testament law is punishable by death. So, we're going to go ahead and pick up. We're going to do something a little bit different. Normally, we read a little piece, then talk, and then read a little piece, and then talk. Um, <clears throat> I would, I think for tonight, I don't want to break up Stephen's speech. So, I'm going to go ahead and read the bulk of this chapter, verses 1 through 50. I'm just going to read it all together, and then we'll talk about it at the end. I just feel like... It didn't seem appropriate for me to break up Stephen's speech. Um, it really does flow better if you read it as a unit. So we're going to read that speech as a unit from verse 1 through verse 50 of chapter 7, Acts chapter 7. And then after we get through that, we'll pause and talk about it a little bit. So Acts chapter 7, verse 1. Stephen has been arrested. He is now able to give his testimony, his defense. So, verse 1. The high priest asks Stephen, Are these accusations true? This, this was Stephen's reply. <clears throat> Brothers and fathers, listen to me. Our glorious God appeared to our ancestor Abraham in Mesopotamia before he settled in Haran. God told him, Leave your native land and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. So Abraham left the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran until his father died. Then God brought him here to the land where you now live. But God gave him no inheritance here, not even one square foot of land. God did promise, however, that eventually the whole land would belong to Abraham and his descendants even though he had no children yet. God also told him that his descendants would live in a foreign land where they would be oppressed as slaves for 400 years. But I will punish the nation that enslaves them, God said. And in the end, they will come out and worship me here in this place. God also gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision at that time. So when Abraham became the father of Isaac, he circumcised him on the eighth day. And the practice was continued when Isaac became the father of Jacob, and when Jacob became the father of the twelve patriarchs of the Israelite tradition, or the Israelite nation. I'm now in verse 9, if you're following along. 
These patriarchs were jealous of their brother Joseph, and they sold him to be a slave in Egypt. But God was with him, and rescued him from all his troubles. And God gave him favor before Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. God also gave Joseph unusual wisdom, so that Pharaoh appointed him governor over all Egypt and put him in charge of the palace. But a famine came upon Egypt and Canaan. There was great misery, and our ancestors ran out of food. Jacob heard that there was still grain in Egypt, so he sent his sons, our ancestors, to go and buy some. The second time they went, Joseph revealed his identity to his brothers, and they were introduced to Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent for his father Jacob and all his relatives to come to Egypt, 75 people in all. So Jacob went to Egypt. He died there, as did our ancestors. Their bodies were taken to Shechem and buried in the tomb Abraham had bought for a certain price from Hamor's sons in Shechem. As the time drew near when God would fulfill his promise to Abraham, the number of our people in Egypt greatly increased. And then a new king came to the throne of Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph. This king exploited our people and oppressed them, forcing parents to abandon their newborn babies so that they would die. At that time, Moses was born, a beautiful child in God's eyes. His parents cared for him at home for three months. When they had to abandon him, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and raised him as her own son. Moses was taught all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was powerful in both speech and action. One day, when Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his relatives, the people of Israel. He saw an Egyptian mistreating an Israelite. So Moses came to the man's defense and avenged him, killing the Egyptian. Moses assumed his fellow Israelites would realize that God had sent him to rescue them, but they did not. The next day, he visited them again and saw two men of Israel fighting. He tried to be a peacemaker. Men, he said, you are brothers. Why are you fighting each other? But the man in the wrong pushed Moses aside. Who made you a ruler and judge over us, he asked. Are you going to kill me as you killed that Egyptian yesterday? When Moses heard that, he fled the country and lived as a foreigner in the land of Midian. And there his two sons were born. Forty years later, in the desert near Mount Sinai, an angel appeared to Moses in the flame of a burning bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight, and he went to take a closer look. The voice of the Lord called out to him, I am the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses shook with terror and did not dare look. Then the Lord said to him, Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their groans and have come down to rescue them. Now go, for I am sending you to Egypt. So God sent back the same man his people had previously rejected when they demanded, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Though the angel, <clears throat> excuse me, through the angel who appeared to him in the burning bush, God sent Moses to be their ruler and savior. And by means of many wonders and miraculous signs, he led them out of Egypt through the Red Sea and through the wilderness for 40 years. Moses himself told the people of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your very own people. Moses was with our ancestors, the assembly of God's people in the wilderness, when the angel spoke to him at Mount Sinai. And there Moses received life-giving words to pass on to us. But our ancestors refused to listen to Moses. They rejected him and wanted to return to Egypt. They told Aaron, Make us some gods who can lead us, for we don't know what has become of this Moses who brought us out of Egypt. So they made an idol shaped like a calf, and they sacrificed to it and celebrated over this thing that they had made. Then God turned away from them and abandoned them to serve the stars of heaven as their gods. In the book of the prophets, it is written, Was it to me you were bringing sacrifices and offerings during those 40 years in the wilderness, Israel? 
No, you carried your pagan gods, the shrine of Molech, the star of your god Raphan, and the images you made to worship them. So I will send you into exile as far away as Babylon. Our ancestors carried the tabernacle with them through the wilderness. It was constructed according to the plan God had shown Moses. Years later, when Joshua led our ancestors in battle against the nations that God drove out of this land, the tabernacle was taken with them into their new territory, and it stayed there until the time of King David. David found favor with God and asked for the privilege of building a permanent temple for the God of Jacob, but it was Solomon who actually built it. However, the Most High does not live in temples made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Could you build me a temple as good as that, asked the Lord? Could you build me such a resting place? Didn't my hands make both heaven and earth? So I'm going to pause there at verse 50 after we've had um, the bulk of Stephen's speech here and just bring up a couple questions. Um, I guess my, my first impression, I don't know about yours, but my first impression is how clear and concise and well-spoken this speech is. Stephen has just given basically the complete history of Israel from Abraham all the way through the building of the temple, all the way through the time of the kings. And he does it, I mean, it's 50 verses, but that's a lot of information to cover that quickly. And he, I think he covers it very well. You know, if you were to try to have a, a 10 minute speech to tell someone that whole history of Israel, I can't imagine a better way to do it. But reading this speech does raise some other questions for me. Um, do you remember why, where Stephen is and what's going on? He has been arrested and he's on trial. And in verse 1 of chapter 7, the high priest asked Stephen, are these accusations against you true? Pastor Matt remarks that Stephen speaks with boldness. Absolutely. The high priest has asked Stephen, is this true? And instead of giving a defense of what he had done, instead of addressing the charges that are brought against him, he goes into this speech describing the history of the people of Israel. But he's speaking to the high priest. He's speaking to the, the, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, the leaders, the teachers of the law. You know, it's... He's getting up and giving a speech to the people who would have taught him the speech. You know, these are the people who would have taught Stephen all this material. And he's standing in front of them repeating it. Now, he does a good job. He doesn't make any mistakes. You know, he doesn't misspeak. None of that happens. But... This is a very bold thing to do. This is like, you know, going to the Supreme Court, you're being asked to give your testimony, and you stand up and start reciting the Constitution. That, that's basically what Stephen here is doing. So Acts chapter 7, you know, verses 1 through 50, are, are really just him stating, I guess you could say, kind of like the Jewish articles of faith. You know, their, their lineage, their, their family story of... Um, of Abraham and then the story of the patriarchs the the 12 you know the 12 leaders that are the names of the 12 tribes of Israel this is a very significant part of their history so I, I guess you could say I wonder where he's going with this right now you and I we know about Jesus so I think we know where this story is leading but this is very bold I think another thing to note here is that when Stephen is put in a place where he has to defend himself, he doesn't depend on his own words. There are multiple places here where he directly quotes the Old Testament, where he directly quotes scripture. Um, it reminds me a little bit of what happened when Jesus was tempted by Satan, and Jesus chose to quote scripture as his defense. And you'll see as we move forward for the rest of this chapter, that there are some very strong parallels between um, how Stephen behaves, what Stephen says and does right here, and the life of Jesus, especially um, what happened when Jesus was arrested and what happened 
as he was on the cross. You'll see some very strong parallels. And, you know, that's probably the highest compliment you could give someone in, in the Bible, that they were a lot like Jesus. Um, so, Stephen was accused of, of making heretical statements. Of, oh yeah, we're getting there, Darlene. Verses 51 through 53 are where he really swings for the fence. You know, Stephen was accused of heresy, of blasphemy, of, of speaking falsely of the teachings of God. And what he has just done, rather than say, no, I didn't, he stands publicly and declares those teachings very clearly and in a very orthodox manner. Um, he is being very clear that he really does know what it means to follow God. He really does know the history. You know, he's, he's, he's a, uh, well, he, he was a pious Jewish person who understood the books of the law, who understood the books of the prophets. He knew these things. They were in his heart. So that's his defense, right? Instead of saying, no, I didn't do these things, he makes it very clear that he really does know what Scripture says. Then, in verses 51 through 53, Stephen, he comes to the climax of his speech. And as Darlene and Pastor Matt have said, this is quite a bold climax. I'm going to pick up here in verse 51 and go to 53. You stubborn people, you are heathens at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did, and so do you. Name one prophet your ancestors did not persecute. They even killed the ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah, whom you betrayed and murdered. You deliberately disobeyed God's law, even though you received it from the hands of angels. Uh, quick translation note, um, that word in verse 51 some versions translate it that you are a heathen at heart. Some versions might say you are a Gentile at heart. The literal translation is uncircumcised. So um, really he's saying you teachers of the law who are supposed to be following the law, you are lawless, right? This is really, this is a slap in the face. This is the, the strongest challenge you could give to any any teacher of the law, but particularly the high priest. Yeah, Darlene makes a reference to this phrase that's used a lot, uh, that they are a stiff-necked people, that they're stubborn. Pastor Matt says the NIV, the New International Version, says your hearts and your ears are not circumcised. Yeah. So you could say heathen hearts. Uh, a way this is said in other places in the Old Testament, in the prophets, is that you have eyes but do not see and ears but do not hear. Um... Pastor Matt says this is a super insult. This is this is a superlative insult. This is the most insulting you could get. Um, this, you know, short of running up and yanking out their beard and talking dirty about their mom, this is about, well, actually, this is probably worse. You know, th this is the worst thing you could do to a Jewish teacher of the law. And to, to, to stand before the high priest and the whole high council and say this to the high priest's face, this is unheard of. This is unheard of. Um, this is the opposite of de-escalation, okay? Um, Stephen here, in what he says, in all, all three verses, but especially verse 53, it, there's no room for interpretation. There's no wiggle room. He says in verse 53, you deliberately disobeyed God's law. These are people whose whole identity was built on trying to follow God's law. And he's saying you deliberately disobey God's law. Um, this challenges everything that they hold dear about themselves. It challenges their identity. And honestly, I think that's why this was such a struggle for them. When Jesus came and tried to tell them something, when he tried to explain that he was the Messiah and that there was grace, it, it challenged their system. Their system was built not just on them observing the law, but also on them having the power to interpret and enforce the law, which put them into a position of authority and privilege. And they didn't want to lose that. 
Stephen here, I mean, what have we heard about Stephen? In, in chapter 6, you know, he was a godly man full of the Holy Spirit. He was appointed by the early church leaders to help feed widows. And he performed miracles and signs. So this is a guy who he fed hungry widows and he healed sick people, right? This is not, he's not a crusader. He's not a conqueror. But maybe in, in the way that he lives, in, in living a Christ-like life, he offers even more of a challenge to their authority than somebody who tried to take it by force, you know, because he's coming with truth rather than with violence and force. Um, <clears throat> I have to wonder, I think many people who were put into Stephen's position, many people who were put before a council who had the authority to punish them or even kill them, you know, how many of us would have held back? I don't mean that we would have completely denied Jesus, but how many of us would have been bold enough to speak the truth like that? Um, I don't know. I mean, Stephen, ha I really think Stephen knew the risk he was taking. I think Stephen knew that by speaking the way that he is right now, he's sealing his fate. Um, he's pushing them so hard and challenging them so hard that there really isn't any question that this is going to lead to his death. And yet he doesn't hesitate. He He's not fearful. He... He just stands and he speaks. You know, he's a witness. He shares his testimony. And this is one of those times where I get a little introspective when I, when I read the Bible. And I wonder if I would be so bold in that situation. I mean, I know in my past there have been times when I was not <laughs> so bold. Times when I was afraid to share or afraid to talk or, or worried about the consequences. <clears throat> I think for Stephen, his only priority is following Jesus. And I guess on one hand, you could say maybe he is challenging the Jewish leaders or arguing with the Jewish leaders, but he's also trying to break through their defenses. He's trying to speak truth to them. Um, he mentions how Israel has rejected the prophets that came to warn them. Um, that's kind of where he is. Venus asks, was the Holy Spirit speaking through him? I think so, yes. In, in chapter 6, the part that came just before this, it said that Stephen was a man who was full of the Holy Spirit. And in the very last verse of chapter 6, it says after he was arrested, it said his face glowed. Which is something we see like when Jesus encounters God... Or like when Moses went in the tabernacle and spent time with God, his face would glow as like a reflection of the Holy Spirit in him. Uh, we got some comments coming in here now. Um, Daryl and Charlene say that Stephen was a willing vessel for God and led by the Spirit. That's a very good way to answer it. Pastor Matt says, Stephen relied on the Holy Spirit for his words and for what came next. Yeah, I think you're both very right. The way that chapter 6 ends does make us very sure that Stephen was a man full of the Holy Spirit who was living by the Holy Spirit. Um, he performed signs and miracles. He glowed, His countenance glowed. His face glowed with the presence of God in his life. So, yeah, I, I don't really have any doubt that Stephen was speaking through the Holy Spirit. And the part that comes next, I think, really does seal the deal. When you see people behaving like Jesus, it's the Holy Spirit coming through. You know, because... Naturally, on our own, that's not how we lean. That's not something we're able to do on our own. But with the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives, it is something that's possible. So Stephen, in verses 51 through 53, has made this very bold accusation against the high priest and the other leaders. And here in verses 54 through 56... They react to that accusation. Uh, here I'm picking up verse 54. The Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation. I think fury is really the only word to use here. The Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation, and they shook their fists at him in rage. 
But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. And he told them, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Um, Another translation note, verse 54, the shaking your fist. It's really a colloquialism about being clenched with anger. Some translations refer to it as grinding your teeth, um, shaking your fist, just a, ah, it's that, but in, in word form, right? Like I'm clenched and I'm angry and I'm scrunched, right? Um, they were infuriated. So Stephen, he gives his speech. He closes it with this accusation, which I think he knows is going to lead to his death. And then as the Jewish leaders respond in fury, Stephen looks up to heaven. It's, a, it's like a standing ovation for Stephen. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Darlene. So he looks up to heaven and he sees Jesus. Um, he uses wording here that is very reminiscent of what David, or sorry, what Daniel talks about, about seeing the Son of Man in glory. You know, Stephen, instead of trying to save his own life, he's only focused on worshiping God, even in that moment. Even in that moment where he's got to know the death sentence is coming, the fists are being shaken at him, and he knows how this story is going to go. He sees Jesus, and he is a witness. He just lovingly and simply tells people what he sees. I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Um, In a way, I think this was a little bit of a gift to Stephen. I think this was... My my friend, Pastor Gates, he says sometimes when we're having a rough time, God gives us a kiss on the cheek. You know, he does something little to help us know that we're loved. I think this was God giving Stephen a big old hug. You know, here's Jesus. I'm letting you see him in heaven. You know, I'm rewarding your faithfulness by seeing, by letting you see what you believe in. Your faith made real. Your faith made sight. So, verses 57 and 58. As Stephen spoke, they put their hands over their ears and they began to shout. They rushed at him and dragging him out of the city, they began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. So... The Jewish leaders speak out in rage. Stephen doesn't cower in fear. He doesn't try to fight back. Stephen just speaks another prophetic word. He has a vision of God and he shares it with them. And the leaders, they act like little children, right? La, 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 la. You know, they clap their hands over their ears and they shout. Lindsay says that, Maybe sees, maybe Stephen sees the heavens open up as a pep talk for what comes next. Yeah, I think that, I think everybody involved, Stephen, all the people, God, everybody knows that Stephen's going to die here. And I think this is, this is God's way of comforting him through that transition. You know, even though Stephen has faith that he's going to go to heaven, even though Stephen has great faith in Jesus, death is not an easy thing, and execution is not an easy thing to go through. And I think this is God helping him. This is God holding his hand, giving him a hug, being present with him in the valley of the shadow of death so that he doesn't have to be afraid. You know, it reminds me of Psalm 23. Stephen is now entering into the valley of the shadow of death. But he's not afraid because God is with him and his rod and his staff comforts him. Now, here's the note for what's coming next in verse 58. That 
the accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. So we know that Saul of Tarsus, who is late, later changes his name to Paul, is there. Daryl and Charlene say, not by power, not by might, but by the Spirit. He was full of glory and he was ready. Bring it on. Yeah. He was ready. Um, I, I don't think there's a better way to say it. He was ready. He was willing to take up his cross and follow Jesus and do whatever God told him to do, to say whatever God told him to say, regardless of the consequences here in this life. So verses 59 and 60. As they stoned him, as, as they're murdering him, Stephen prayed. And these are the words that he said. Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees and shouted, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. So here... In Stephen's moment of death, after he's just had this vision of Jesus standing in glory at the right hand of God the Father, Stephen lives out a direct parallel to Jesus' death. Um, Jesus on the cross said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And Stephen, as he is being stoned, says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. A direct parallel. When Jesus was on the cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Stephen prays, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. Another direct parallel. Um, Stephen doesn't show up for a long time in the Bible. You know, He's not a guy like Paul or David who shows up in a bunch of different books and who had this super long life and all this. But... In these moments, in this speech, which in real time probably didn't take that long. I mean, our Bible study, we've, we've only been reading this for probably about 40 minutes. And we've stopped to talk in between. So this whole thing, even with them dragging him out of the city, didn't take that long. And yet, Stephen, I mean, Wow. I mean, Stephen makes an impact with his life. He speaks the truth of Scripture. He witnesses to who Jesus is. He calls people to repentance. As he's dying, he prays that the people who are murdering him would be forgiven. I mean, it is the exact representation of Christ-like love. It's exactly how Christ showed love to pray for the forgiveness of those who were killing him. Now, I don't I'm not trying to deify Stephen, right? But I do think that Stephen is a person who on the sport on the spiritual formation scale, he was very much conformed to the image of Christ. God worked in Stephen's life and changed him, made him into a godly man made him into a man like Jesus. And while I do not want to have to face the things that Stephen faced, I do pray that some t someday myself and you, all of you, would be in a position like Stephen where we could where we could live well. Yeah, the Sloan said, they put you in a pit and stones rain down on you, not pretty. Yeah. And honestly, if they were doing it hastily, it was even worse because they didn't always have the pit or the big stones ready. And they just hit you and hit you and hit you. Um, it was not, you know, save for crucifixion. It was one of the more terrible ways to die. But Stephen finished his race well. He... He stood for God. He did not falter. Um, but he also acted in love when he was challenged and attacked. He didn't fight. He didn't fight in the traditional sense. Not like Peter in the garden pulling a sword. 
but he just, it's like God poured out of him. <laughs> I don't know how, another way to say it. It's like he just opened up his mouth and God poured out. His whole life just overflowed with God's spirit. So much so that he's, he becomes just like Jesus. So my closing prayer for us tonight is that we would be able to be in that position. That we would be in that position where we could, in our dying moment, know for sure that we were doing exactly what God had us there to do. That we had carried ourselves well. That we had followed God's instructions. That we had leaned on God's wisdom. That we had received God's spirit. Pastor Matt says, saturated with the spirit. That's a good way to say it. I pray that each of us gets to that point. I know some people in this life who are pretty close to that. I've met some, I guess you'd call them saints of the church. Um, but you know, this is available to all of us. That same Holy Spirit that was present in Stephen's life is available to you and I. And I'd like to pray right now that we would all receive that spirit to be saturated by it and to have it pour out of us. So, please join me in prayer. Father God, I thank you for the life and the testimony and the story of Stephen. I thank you for the words that you gave him, but more than that, I thank you for the way that you changed him, the way that you had him live out your will, the way that he was saturated with your spirit, the way that it overflowed out of him. And Father, I pray that you would help each of us to be that. That you would help each of us listening here tonight, each of us who are part of this tonight, to be saturated by your spirit in that way. So that it might flow out of us into a world that so desperately needs it. In Jesus' name, amen. So, it's a little bit of a solemn evening. So I'm not going to close with any jokes or silliness. Just close with that prayer. Pray it for yourselves and pray it for your brothers and sisters that we might all be saturated with God's spirit. God bless.